Hey everybody, how you doing? Today is uh, UFO TV day. Uh, we're chatting with a, uh, a brilliant guy who has, uh, a, well, one, written a book on J. Allen Hynek's life, uh, The Close Encounters Man, but there's a few cool TV programs on right now. UFO Witness and uh, UFOs Investigating the Unknown, which just came out. Both are Mark O'Connell projects. Yeah. And uh, he even wrote for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. This guy's been into this for years and uh, he lets the stars kind of shine in his productions. He's more behind the scenes, but nonetheless, a big enough guy, big enough brain and uh, super well-spoken and just a nice guy. So uh, we're really happy to have him on the show. I know, Jay, you're going to have some things to relate MUFON wise and yeah. I've seen the TV programs and uh, I got some questions. So it's going to be a fun day today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, especially his, his move on uh, investigative career that he's he's done as well. So he's been at it for a while. It should be an interesting conversation. For sure. So with that, we'll be right back in just a moment with uh, Mark O'Connell right here on UAP Studies Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of UAP Studies Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good buddy, Mr. Jason Gilmet. Hey, this is a, this is a good day. We've uh, we've done quite a few of interviews. We mentioned that throughout a couple of episodes, but this was all the combination of a one weekend's work. And uh, today we uh, we close with Mark O'Connell, which is joining us. And uh, I'm going to let you do the intro, my man. You're yeah, absolutely. We've never had a writer for Star Trek on our program. I think that is awesome. Uh, so Mark is the executive producer at Anomaly Entertainment, uh, the author of uh, several books, as I mentioned, writer for uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, he's a TV presenter. You may have seen some of his programs, UFO Witness and uh, Investigating the Unknown. And he also wrote a book, The Close Encounters Man. And uh, that basically documents the life of uh, J. Allen Hynek, a very well-known figure. So big brain in the house today. We're super excited to have him. So welcome to the show, Mr. Mark O'Connell. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for uh, for agreeing to do this. And we've had some of your colleagues on before, uh, Ben Hansen, mm -hmm. Melissa Tittle from uh, UFO Witness. Uh, so we'll chat about UFOs and all that. But for uh, the beginning, uh, for anyone who doesn't know you or is not familiar with you, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you into this line of work, and then why UFO related content. <laughs> the big question, why exactly. UFOs? You know, there was a time a, a few years ago when I first started um, blogging about UFOs. And I would just start talking about it with my family and stuff. And I just remember this one day when my oldest son, um just sort of looked over at my wife and said we need to talk about dad <laughs> <laughs> like you guys it's really okay it's really okay i mean it's a hobby that's turned into sort of a profession i guess you know now that i've had a book published and I've had these tv shows so it's it's been a really fun journey i've been i've been um crazy about space and ufos and science fiction and science fact and I, for all my life and, and i i think i always trace it back to this moment when i was about three years old so i'm dating myself here it was 1963 and there was this brand new tv show called the outer limits that premiered in 1963 a lot of your listeners may be familiar with the show it was a science fiction anthology show. It was very dark and moody and expressionistic. And they had really these really brilliant cinematographers who just made every image look like dangerous and threatening. And, and they had great monsters. That was the thing about The Outer Limits. They had really, really scary monsters to a three-year-old. And I had this is one of my earliest, if not the earliest, conscious memory I've had is that my mom watching the pilot episode of The Outer Limits in 1963 and the monster appears it's this alien from that's made out of radiation scared the living daylights out of me and i remember running upstairs and just hiding around the corner and just saying just saying tell me when the monster goes away i'm not coming out of here until the monster goes away so i you know so i sat up there for the rest of the show because apparently my mom was not very sympathetic to me she kept watching the show <laughs> it was the so, pilot but, she had to 
Well, yeah, but I never knew that my mom was interested in that kind of stuff. She usually went in for detective shows like Columbo and stuff. But at any rate, so that's kind of how the seed got planted. It was that that traumatic moment when I was three years old, when the, the galaxy being from the Outer Limits suddenly appeared on my TV and just scared me to death. So that's just grown and grown. I grew up in a really small town in Wisconsin. My mom was one of the town librarians, so she would always take me to the library with her. Uh, and I loved to read. And the, this it was a small library, so they only had like this one narrow section of shelves that had you know, there's books about UFOs and Bigfoot and Bermuda Triangle and poltergeists and all that scary stuff. So I would read these books and, you know, scare myself half to death with the stories they told. Um, but, you know, my fascination just grew and grew and grew. Uh, and then um, about 10 or 12 years ago, a friend of mine convinced me that I should start uh, blogging about UFOs because it was something I knew enough about and I had an, I would have fun talking about about uh, the topic. So I started doing that. That grew into a podcast that, the, the, you know, it just it grew into all these unexpected things. Um, but the best moment of all of that was when I was I was lucky enough to be able to do some research for my book, The Close Encounters Man, um, at this place in Chicago called KUFOS, the Center for UFO Studies. It was a foundation formed by J. Allen Hynek. And um, the, the scientific director of KUFOS was kind enough to let me come in and poke around his Hynek files looking for things to write about in my uh, blog. And one, one day when I was doing research there, uh, Mark, his name's Mark Rodiger, you may be familiar with him. Um, Mark said, you know, I've been reading some of your uh, blog and I'm really enjoying it. I like your style. And he said, I'm wondering if you'd be interested in writing uh, an account of J. Allen Hynek's career. And I just said, yeah, of course I would. <laughs> Heck yeah, that's the most amazing offer I've ever had. That's, that's great. So I, I jumped on the opportunity. I kind of shoved every other project off my desk. <laughs> that I could get away with postponing and just went whole hog into researching the book. So that's, how, you know, and then like five years later, the book was finally published. There was a lot of research to be done. It took me a long, long time. Um, and so the book has led to all sorts of other opportunities. Like you mentioned, one of the TV shows, UFOs Investigating the Unknown. There's a whole story behind that that I'm sure we'll get to, but I'm I'm really excited and really proud of that show. Uh, it's a, it's a five, five part documentary, um, that is currently streaming on Hulu. And, uh, I am featured in episodes two and three, because those are the episodes basically dealing with, um, the historical aspect of, of the UFO phenomenon. So project, a lot of project blue book stuff, a lot of talk about, uh, Dr. Hynek. Um, so that's, that's where, that's where I am today. You just got the long version of my life story. No, that's good. Well, that's what we want to know, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as as we all know, there's a bit of a rabbit hole that you fall into when you get into the subject of ufology, and oh, yeah. it's many depths and layers, and it seems like it's it, it transcends everything that we know in reality and affects people consciously and mentally and physically and all, all the above. Um, as you're investigating this, uh, you know, with the TV show and, and like, have you found that you've opened up more to different venues that that sort of or paths that ufology sort of leads you down to? Like, have you been more open to new ideas? I would say yes. Um, one thing I left out of my biography that I just gave you is that also it started out as part research for my uh, for my um, blog. I signed on as a, a certified field investigator for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. And I did that for about five years. And that was really invaluable to me um, while writing the book because I really needed to, I didn't realize this at the time when I first signed up, I just thought it would be kind of a, a lark to be, you know, get, get phone calls and say, Mark, a UFO has been sighted, go investigate. You know, I thought that would be kind of fun, which, and it was. Um, but uh, what I learned from doing that work, volunteering, 
I did it about five years and I, I investigated about 150 cases in oh, five wow. years. And yeah, but you have That's to understand. In, yeah. so, most of the time, investigating simply means you spent a half hour on the phone with the witness and they, you know, filled in a few details from the written report that they had filed. So, so in, you know, investigating a case doesn't always mean, you know, you invest days and weeks in it. It's sometimes it's a really very brief thing simply because there just isn't enough information in the report to really go much further than that. But the big thing about, I keep on getting distracted, the big thing about volunteering to be an, an investigator for MUFON was it enabled me to get this immediate glimpse into the witness's state of mind. What, you know, what kind of person, first of all, what kind of person sees a UFO? Second of all, what kind of a person reports seeing a ufo and third of all how does that affect them and i found that i found that end of of the business to be the most fascinating it was and i always considered it really an honor because for a great number of these uh, of these folks reporting their ufo encounter um i was the first person they were ever sharing this story with and I really felt I really felt honored and privileged to be, you know, the person who's hearing this story for the first time because they're they're some of these stories are really fascinating and they'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. They can be really chilling and, and really eerie. And I certainly encountered plenty of those uh kinds of cases when I was when I was working for MUFON. But that was that was to answer your question. That was the big thing that broadened my mind and made me start considering different ways to look at the phenomena. I'm a great believer in not being certain. Okay. <laughs> I, I I kind of enjoy the fact that, that there's so much uncertainty surrounding the phenomenon. Um, but but working with and meeting and interviewing these these uh, people who had experienced the UFO event was was a huge education. Uh, met some really fascinating people and heard some really kind of mind-blowing stories. Yeah. I was going to ask you, in terms of doing a research for your book, you're pouring over data and materials from the 50s. I'm sure there was a certain language and kind of a, an opinion in a lot of the stuff that you would have read and all the, all through the life of J. Allen Hynek. And now you're producing content, television shows, where you're in charge of the dialogue and the verbiage and language used. So have you noticed changes? Obviously, there are changes. But what mm -hmm. specifically have you noticed from like the 50s until now? How do we look at this topic? And mm -hmm. how do we put it into words? Or, you know, yeah. has there been a maturation, so to speak, of UFO dialogue? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. I, I don't think I've really thought about it that way, but I, I can... I think you're right. I think that there was, looking back over my research, um, going back to the old, the old, old stuff from, you know, the late 40s and early 50s, there was, um, surprisingly, at, at, in that time frame, there was a little more openness about UFO conversations. People were still curious enough about, and and not just you know UFO buffs, but everybody, yeah. everybody was so curious about UFO stuff going on, and science fiction was really becoming a, a huge genre in the movie industry. Uh, throughout the fifties, there were so many science fiction movies made about UFOs and alien invasions, and people had that on the brain. And there was you know there was the leftover paranoia from World War II and you know, could these things be plotting another Pearl Harbor? Do we need to be worried that these things are going to harm us? Just really fascinating stuff. So I think there was actually, in a weird way, a, more, a, a higher level of openness about how to talk about UFOs. Uh, whereas now, well, now it's kind of come full circle, I guess. Um, but in the 80s and 90s, the uh, it became harder and harder, I think, to talk openly about UFOs because, you know, after 20 or 30 years of the phenomenon, people had become kind of jaded. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, 70 years later, after the after the first real modern UFO event, are, are we any closer to understanding yeah. the phenomenon? Uh, not doesn't seem like we are to me. That's one of my gripes with ufology right now. 
we don't really seem to have gotten very far. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind no, of definitely. that's kind it, of my. Uh, I it think, makes sense, I, I think, right? People would be less judgmental if it was a new and emerging thing. Now exactly. we've had 70 years to get foul and crusty over the fact that we still yeah. don't have proof and yeah. may not be any closer than we thought we were back then. Yeah, 70 years of disappointment will do that to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's also the um, global acknowledgement that we should all agree that this is something that is happening, something that people are witnessing every day. And we haven't had that because there's been no... Uh, no country really stepping forward. And, well, there's been smaller countries, but they're almost insignificant at this point when they're saying, hey, we're seeing things over our skies that don't make sense. We're all waiting for the big countries. And recently we've had that, you know, with uh, the United States and Canada sort of uh, cooperating and shooting a few things down over airspace. Uh, but it hasn't really been, you know, really mentioned by other countries that they're having problems with UFOs, even though they're very open with their information like France, England, Mexico is very open to that too. But it seems like we're not validating the phenomenon globally until the United States officially stands up and says, we have a problem. And it seems like we're, like every country, including Canada, where we live, uh, we're all on like, you know, holding our breaths. Like it's any moment now, it's any moment now. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> that, put, that puts the pressure on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But but not not saying that the United States needs to be the country that, that stands up and speak out. But I think if it's, uh, you know, something that we need to all start talking about, like, you know, are you also experiencing things over your airspace that doesn't make sense, you know, uh, physically and, and what we understand of reality? This subject is so in-depth that, uh, you know, it's not just the technology, but Who's behind the technology? That's that's the the part I'm more fascinated by. This phenomenon is if we think we're impressed with this. You know what might be just a Toyota to them. Uh, you know we're we're amazed by what their capabilities are. Imagine what else they have up their sleeve, and uh -huh. yeah, that's part of the phenomenon that to me I've always been fascinated by. Um, the more that you investigate, do you have any favorite stories that that really are are good or stuck with you over the years? Oh yeah, one of one of my favorite. Well, I, I can give you a couple examples from my MUFON work. One was a um, a report had been filed by a, a former policeman. He, he was at that point he was an educator, and I believe he was teaching at like a police academy kind of kind of a place. Um, and and he was African American, which is interesting because if you look at the overall UFO phenomenon, the presence of African Americans in this whole thing is strangely small um so th so i took no note of that that was of interest but he he told me the story about how he and his wife several years earlier um now this is in the state of wisconsin this was where i was for a while for a while i was like the assistant state uh, director for mufon so i'm interviewing this gentleman and he's telling me this story about how he and his wife and their young child were uh driving to a small a rural town in northern wisconsin uh, to visit with some friends and to stay overnight at their at their house. So they're driving through the night on this, and this is like the classic UFO setup, right? They're driving late at night on this deserted highway in the middle of nowhere in rural Wisconsin, and they see something. They see a, a what they you know initially think is a star or a planet up in the sky, you know, moving across moving across the night sky. They take notice of that, of course. And they start paying attention to where this thing is going and what it's doing. And what it ends up doing is flashing pretty close to their car and then settling down into some sort of gully or depression a little bit off to the side of the road they're on. It just sort of disappears into this, into this gully and they, they're too nervous to stop and like look at it. That's they want to get yeah. now they want to just get to their friend's house right so that's what they do they they hightail it to their friend's house um and the friends say hey where have you guys been you know you're like 15 minutes late from when we expected you so you know uh, wow another red flag a missing time episode is that what we're looking at and so they you know they're hanging out with their friends they kind of forget about what happened on the drive and they spend the night at their friends next morning next morning they're driving back home and they go back of course along the same 
highway and they get to where they spotted this thing the night before and there's a house there and they're like well that, that's weird there wasn't a house there yesterday was there and they so so and then but they're not sure if it was even a house they were looking at you know you get to this point in some of these reports where the people they've experienced something that we don't have words for right you know and that was definitely the case with with this couple they 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 were just they were left in a complete confusion over what they actually saw and did they even see anything it was one of these you know they ended up just doubting their own senses and doubting their own reason their own rationality so and that was one of those cases that kind of made the hair in the back of my neck stand up because he was you know you, you even though you're just on the phone you can tell uh when you can you can sense stress in a person's voice you can yeah. you can sense fear in a person's voice that's not that much of a stretch and with this gentleman in particular there was definitely you know stress in his voice he had really this event had really stuck with him and it haunted him. And um, as an investigator, I would love to have more than one witness. So I asked him, would it be possible to talk to your ex-wife? And he he very sadly, he, he just said, no, I'm afraid not. He's like, she, she refuses to talk about this to this day. She just clammed up about it, you know, when, when it happened. And she absolutely refuses to talk about it. So that was a huge disappointment because having a corroborating witness would be obviously yeah. would be really really huge. Um, but I but yeah his his story really stood out because it was just so it was unique and his the way he told the story I found very convincing. Um, you know again it's one of these things where you have to think well what does this person have to gain by reporting this? They, they actually they have nothing to gain except to just get it off their chest. And that was here's another really interesting thing I learned working for MUFON. Most of the UFO witnesses I talk to, they have two questions right off the bat. Number one question is, what did I see? And the number two question is, has anyone else seen it? And it got to the point where that sort of became my litmus test. If if I was interviewing somebody and they asked those two questions, I'd think. Yes, I. You just you just made me a believer in your story because that is that is like it's just such a perfectly human reaction, you know, to what's to what's going on. And conversely, if I was interviewing a witness and they didn't ask those questions, I you know I'd be maybe a little a little more skeptical about about their claims and their stories. I also had one really weird incident where, over the course of a couple months. I investigated uh, events with two young women who both grew up in Wisconsin. They were about the same age. They actually kind of looked like they could be sisters. And it was months be months between their reports. So it's not like I was interviewing both at the same time. I interviewed one at this point, and then several months later, I interviewed the other one. And it was just uncanny to me how similar their experiences were because they involved weird weird nightmares, weird dreams that they weren't sure if they were actually dreams or reality. That one also kind of creeped me out. The trouble is, it's like, where do you go with that? How do you, how do you investigate it? What are you actually investigating? It can be very, very frustrating yeah. because we don't always know what we're looking for. Yeah. And sometimes as a move on field investigator, you're, you know, sort of thrown into something that might be out of your league, but there's nobody else investigating it. So you yeah, have no choice. True. You're the go-to guy, regardless mm -hmm. of the situation, right? Yeah. yeah. Have you found that a lot of people are more open to discuss their, their experiences with somebody like yourself that's been investigating yeah. this? And I mean, you're out there, right? Like you're, you're, you're promoting that you're investigating this. So have you had people that surprised you and, and come forward? Jason, I've had I have had so many times where I've been in some sort of social uh, situation at a party or a backyard cookout or whatever, and of course all my friends know I'm doing this stuff and they knew knew that I was writing a book and all this stuff. But so many times when I'd be at one of these gatherings, and and somebody out of the blue would say, "Oh, Mark, I hear you know I, I hear you're writing a book about UFOs. I'd love to hear about that." And I you know I start giving them the sales pitch on the book. And what will happen very often is somebody who's been kind of quiet and kind of on the edge of the group 
after I get done, you know, saying, you know, descri describing my work, this quiet person out on the fringes will say, you know, I, I had an experience like that once. And I'll say, oh, would you like to talk about it? And that, you know, if they, if they sense that they they are in a safe, ridicule-free zone, they'll talk. They'll tell you their story. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, very often you'll find that you know you're you're the first person they've ever shared this story with. That that has happened so many times. I can't even I can't even come up with a number, but it's very typical, and it it teaches me two things. First of all, a lot of people are seeing UFOs. Yeah. and not reporting it at all. And second of all, um, they really, really want to tell somebody about what they've experienced, but they've never felt brave enough to do it. So so I always try to make um, UFO witnesses just feel like they're being listened to. They're being, you know, somebody's paying attention and I'm, I'm listening to their story and I'm not rolling my eyes or yawning. You know, I'm I'm focused on them. I want to know their story. I want to know their truth. So um, that's a very powerful experience. I got to say, you know, I, I signed on with MUFON really not knowing what to expect. Um, and, and it became, as I've been saying, it just became really a pretty intense uh, learning experience for me. So after this many years of researching, hearing people's accounts, you know, gathering data for books and TV series and trying to make it factual, I want to get your thoughts or at least your best guess as to what do you think this phenomenon is? Everybody has uh -huh. a cool individual take on it. And I'm uh -huh. curious to know yours. <laughs> well, let me let me preface this by saying I'm one of the I'm one of the people who um, so much of the current state of ufology is fixated on nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts, objects, nuts and bolts, crafts or spaceships, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, and I love playing around with that idea. Believe me, I told you my background with science fiction and science fiction movies and aliens and stuff. So I, I, I completely understand and appreciate that point of view. But at the same time, I always feel like, but, 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 but we don't know that. We don't know that they're solid objects. We just don't know. And we may never know. And you got to be okay with that. I think there, you know, you can't, you can't force a conclusion and say, well, we've been studying this long enough. Let's just call time of death. Let's just say they're physical objects. They, they've come from another planet and they're here to observe us all of which may be true, but we also have to consider the fact that it may be something completely different. Like Dr. Heineck used to say every once in a while during an interview, he would say, you know, this could be something that's just completely beyond our ability to understand, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And I, and I think he's, I think he makes a valid point. We may never be able to understand it. I, I, when I think of what I believe in about UFOs, I don't have like a set image or, or scheme or whatever for exactly what I think they are. Um, I'm like I said earlier. I'm I'm comfortable with not knowing. I think I think not knowing is kind of one of the thrills of working in this field. Not not knowing what you're looking for and not knowing what you'll find. Um, but you you end up having a lot of uh, really interesting adventures and experiences along the way. That's for sure. Yeah, and it sort of teaches you too that reality is is a lot more than we think it is, because yeah. it opens up that possibility. Like, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely, uh, right. yeah, it, it could be interdimensional or, or extra tempestrial or ultra terrestrial. Like, there's all these yeah. possibilities, and Louis and I always say it could be all of the above. It yeah. could be such a complicated thing that even if the government wanted to come out and and say, "Here's what we know." That would freak the public out, saying that it's probably all of the above, and we can't control any, you know, coming and goings of these entities. They'll do as mm -hmm. they will. Uh, even if we were speaking with Kevin Day, and he thinks no way, there's no way that we can defend against that kind of technology. Like mm -hmm. we, he said, we we we'd get more luck if we prayed uh, than uh, than if we actually use our technology. And uh -huh. what we've seen and what, uh, you, you know, you've discovered and, and uh, investigated, uh, these crafts don't, they don't operate in any way that we understand uh, not only flight, but the consciousness of it, like how it maneuvers and it mm -hmm. avoids collisions in the sky, stops on a dime, goes at right angles out of, you know, at full speed and never loses speed or momentum. Uh, mm -hmm. We can't do that as humans. That's not, and physically, we couldn't even be able to survive that. Mm -hmm. 
So as you're investigating this, uh, have you found that like any information on why we were seeing saucers before and now we're seeing orbs uh, a lot more than, than before? So what do you have a theory on why that that transition between what people are seeing? Well, uh, first, I'll say um, when when people ask me if I, you know, if I believe in UFOs or ask me what they are, my my answer is. I believe there is a fundamental reality to the UFO phenomenon. Those, that's my belief. I don't know what that reality is. I, we may never know what it is, but as I was saying before, it's kind of fun trying to find out. But you, what you were talking about though, Jason, kind of was making me think of how um, I've always been really interested in the fact that there's a duality to the phenomenon, that the the um a ufo can seem to be it can behave like a solid object in one in one moment and a moment later it can behave like something non-physical completely non-physical like yeah not not imaginary but um you know something that exists on a different different plane than what we're used to ex experiencing i had a really interesting talk one of the one of the most exciting interviews i did for my book was with douglas trumbull who did the special effects for 2001 he did the special effects for blade runner for star trek the motion picture he's just he was he's always been one of my idols and to get a chance to actually visit him at his home and interview him was one of the one of the biggest thrills of my life but doug had this really interesting theory he said have you ever noticed how in so many UFO encounter cases, the, the event begins with the witnesses seeing something in the sky that gets closer and closer and closer to them. And then, you know, becomes this weird glowing craft or whatever. But he said then, when the event is over, the object doesn't repeat its movements as it leaves. It just disappears. I thought, and, and, and so Doug was like, so what if they're using some sort of propulsion or navigation system that um, is, has, an, has enough room for doubt that they don't want to materialize too close to the planet Earth because that would be dangerous. So instead they approach from a distance and they, and they let the prospective witness see them coming, okay? But then when it's time to go, they don't have to worry about their coordinates because they know exactly where they're going back to. So boom, they just seem to disappear or zoom away at a million miles an hour. I I, I got such a kick out of that theory. I still think about that every once in a while. It's because it's like, you're genius. Of course, that actually that actually fits the facts as much as you can fit, you know, yeah. whatever you decide the facts are. But I thought that was a really brilliant take from Doug on you know why why they behave the way they do but he was really into this idea of uh, one of the reasons i was visiting him was he was um he was previewing a demo reel of this movie he wanted to produce and he he was using this unbelievably sophisticated uh 3d um cinematography system it was really really cool but the ufos in this short film that he made that he was previewing the ufos he actually captured an image of something that is solid one moment and then is gaseous the next moment and then is something completely beyond our comprehension the next moment. And it's all just happening before your eyes inside this, this dome theater you're sitting in. It was just fascinating. And I've, those, those, those images, those thoughts of his have just never left me because I, I've always thought, you know, I think, it's it's a pity he's no longer with us because I think he, I think he was onto something. I think he had a really really credible and um, really engaging view of what it is we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. it's like they're slowing themselves down just for us to see, right? It's uh, yeah, they didn't want to be seen, they wouldn't. It's pretty clear. Like if you see a plane going by at night, the only reason you know it's there is you hear it and you see flashing lights. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to be stealth, they could. And their technology is such yeah. that 
you know, I'm sure they could just be invisible if they wanted to. And we've heard a lot of people say that, that they're doing this for us. And because mm -hmm. their tech is so far above our pay grade, they really have to dumb it down. And yeah. people have even hypothesized that that's what grays are. It's a hominid fabrication of something that will recognize because if it was just a voice in your head, you'd probably go crazy, right? Or think you were crazy. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of what we see is for our own benefit and maybe the uh -huh. distance as well. We hear people with medical ramifications of coming too close to a craft or yeah. being touched by these things. And then they have weird autoimmune diseases. Gary Nolan touched on that. So maybe a lot of what they're doing is for our own benefit, but it's just, it's not stranger than we think. It's stranger than we can think. And we may right. never get the answer. Yeah. You had, you had said something about orbs earlier, right? Did you? Yeah. yeah. I've got an orb story for you. I, is it a blue orb? Made, is it like a friendly that? orb or a bad orb? Um, well, it's, that's, we've kind heard of, both. that's kind of open to interpretation. No, here's what, here's what happened. So, so as I was trying to finish my book to meet my publisher's deadline, I took a leave of absence from MUFON because it was just sucking up too much of my time that I needed for working on the book. Um, and so I, I sort of dropped out of MUFON for, I don't know, maybe eight or nine months. And then when I was finished with the book and sent it off with the publisher, I thought, okay, I want to get back into this MUFON stuff because it's really been, it's been enjoyable and it's been rewarding and I want to do some more of it because I want to meet more UFO witnesses. So I rejoined and, and uh, discovered that in my absence, the state of Wisconsin MUFON director had moved on and we had a new acting director. Um, so I sort of got introduced to her and we sort of compared notes. And, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm glad to be back. I want to please, please start assigning cases to me because I, I want to get back into this. And she said, okay, but, you know, before you start that, she said, I really have to talk to you about the orbs. And I'm like, okay, what about the orbs? I, I don't, at that point, I didn't recall any of my witnesses ever talking about orbs, honestly. 150 cases. I don't think a single person ever talked about orbs. But it turned out this woman who was the new interim director in Wisconsin was like all about the orbs. And she just started really criticizing my work and saying, well, you obviously don't know what you're doing because all of these cases you investigated are obviously orbs. What had happened was she, she went back into my old case files and changed my conclusions <laughs> Are from, you serious? From unknown to orbs. I'm serious. I was so pissed off and I reported it to my elders at MUFON and oh, nothing ever happened. It was just, you know, they just sort of swept it aside. I don't know. That's a that's a that's a pretty negative story, but that was my experience. I was and, and you know, and so I dropped back out of MUFON. I I didn't want to rejoin after that because I thought this woman was really out of line really That's... doing some bad things yeah. i mean you can't be messing with the data like that and you can't you can't and how does she know more about these cases than i do she didn't talk to the witness yeah. right she, she just went through with her red pens you know scratched out scratched that's a typical out debunker right or what typical debunker i haven't done any of the work i have yeah. nowhere near the experience at it that you do but you're wrong my mind's made up end of yeah. story yeah. And then she started pressuring me. A friend of hers had just written a book about orbs and she started pressuring me to buy his book. And that's where I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is, yeah. this isn't working for me right now. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to unjoin again. <laughs> so, just, yeah. So yeah. that, that's my, that's my orb tale of woe. Well, that left a bit of a, a sour taste in your mouth, obviously, because yeah. that's your introduction to it. It's not not too good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But the, it 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 is weird though, because what we're seeing in the skies now, um, compared to what was seen in the skies back in the fifties and sixties, it seems like I don't know if it's our comprehension of what we're seeing that is not making sense like if we're you know before we didn't understand what we're looking at like it seems like they've changed from you know the the classic flying saucer that everybody was reporting in the 50s and now we're getting these weird shapes tic tacs or cubes that are flying in the middle of the sky triangles, that, yeah. triangles um even the the phoenix light like a massive yeah. boomerang ship that yeah. you know, hovered above a city and didn't make a sound like that we everybody knows that's not normal that that's not a human technology and it it uh -huh. seems foreign right but it's yeah. it seems like we have all these different 
crafts. And if it was one species, it would, like I said, be recognizable by their technology mm-hmm. over and over again. But this phenomenon is so amazing because it's constantly changing and people aren't seeing the same thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you have a theory on that? No, <laughs> I no. wish I did. <laughs> I've, definitely, I've, yeah. I've definitely, I've definitely thought about it and wondered about it because it's undeniable. I mean, it's, yeah. it, you can't, you can't, you can't disagree. Yes, they the way these things present themselves to us and, you know, and maybe they're presenting themselves accidentally or maybe it's intentional and it's performative. I don't know. But the way they present themselves to us definitely has changed. And and to us, from our limited frame of reference, it's really hard to understand why why they've changed. What would be the point if you've got technology? You know, let's let's assume that it's a nuts and bolts bolts craft and it's you know controlled by an intelligence an intelligent being you know if you, if you've got the know-how to to you know construct this craft and come here to earth you know why do you need to change the design it's not like you know it's not like detroit where they change the design of the cars every year well, why are you know why did they start out as saucers and cigars and now they're triangles and delta wings and and uh, yeah, Such a it's, variety, it's a puzzler. Right? You can yeah. drive yourself nuts trying to trying to figure stuff like that. Or out. maybe they're just getting better. Look at our tech seventy years ago yeah, and our tech now. True. If, true if they're that advanced, seventy years would uh-huh. probably be the equivalent of a thousand years of growth for us, right? It wouldn't <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah, you're probably right. Wouldn't be equal, yeah. but uh-huh. but I wanted to ask you about your programs, not just to promote them. Yeah. I do like them, but um, uh, slightly different angles, right? With UFO witness versus mm-hmm. UFOs uh, investigating the unknown. So. Tell us a little bit about your shows and kind of what you uncover on each. Well, um, shortly after my book was published, that was 2017. Uh, my uh, my uh, agent and I started talking to this production company, Anomaly Entertainment. Uh, there was a couple of producers from the Science Channel who started their own production company and, and specialized in paranormal stuff and Shark Week. They've got two areas of specialization. I always thought that was kind of a kick. <laughs> um, but we went back and forth with Anomaly for a while about whether there was a way to, you know, to use material in my book or material. Not My approach actually was, you know, I've got so much stuff that I couldn't include in the book because I was already over my word count and they wouldn't let me add anything more. So I've got all sorts of really compelling UFO stories in my file cabinet that I've never shared with anyone. Um, so that was my approach to Anomaly, and they bit eventually, and the series started to develop. Oh, it sort of lost lost my original idea at some point or another, you know, because once more people start to get involved in developing the project, then, you you know, every, everybody's opinion, everybody has some input, and, you know, the nature of the storyline changes. The big thing I wanted out of UFO Witness, though, that, that I was very happy with, because I, I thought we did accomplish it, was you may, if you've seen the show lately, in the first couple episodes, we featured this lovely lady named Jenny Zeidman. Mm -hmm. She's passed away since then, but at the time, along with Robert, Colonel Robert Friend, Jenny was the oldest surviving Project Blue Book investigator. Mm -hmm. And I, I met her in the course of writing my book. In fact, it's, it's one of my, one of my favorite stories is, um, I tried and tried and tried to interview her when I was writing the book. And I just, I, never made any progress. Um, I talked with her once very briefly and I said, I'm, you know, I'm writing a biography of your friend, Ellen Hynek. I would love to interview you. And she said, well, you know, I've already written about that part of my life. It's all been published in the Ohio MUFON journal, you know, look that over, feel free to quote me from there all you want. And I said, well, I really appreciate that. But I said, I'd still, I'd love to hear your thoughts now, because now it's like 30 years later. What, you know, what do you think about the phenomenon now? And she hung up on me. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I sat there holding my phone for a few seconds thinking, should I call her back and try again? But I just thought, no, I mean, obviously she wants to leave the past in the past and I, I need to respect that. So reluctantly, I gave up on the idea of interviewing Jenny, but I was able to use some of her quotes from her writing so that it all worked out all right. But then a couple of weeks after the book was published, I got a, I got an email from Jenny's son, uh, Barry, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm Jenny Zeidman's son. She'd like to talk to you about your book. Would you be free to talk to her sometime? Can I, you know, send her your contact info? 
And I, honestly, I was scared to death because I was like, oh, what does she want to talk to me about concerning my books? But we set it up and I got on the phone or, or actually, no, we, we emailed at that point. Um, and she said, Mark, I just wanted you to know I just read your book. And she said, you wrote Alan exactly as I remembered him. And I just wanted to thank you for that. So, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's yeah. that's the best fan mail I've ever gotten. Yeah. yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, she wrote another email and she said, she said, well, Mark, I just finished reading the book for the second time. And for the second time, I was in I was in tears by the time I was done with the book. So I felt great about that. And so I made it my mission that I wanted to get Jenny Zeidman on TV to talk about her amazing experiences working with Dr. Hynek. And so we ultimately succeeded in that. In the first season of UFO Witness, uh, we have Jenny in the first couple of episodes. Um, at this point, she had gotten pretty old and frail, so she's a little slow to respond to questions and stuff. You can tell she's, you know, she's getting tired. And so I would have loved to interview her for like three or four days. Um, she just had such amazing stories to tell and we couldn't, we couldn't use them all. We could only use a fraction of them really, but I love so I was really thrilled that we succeeded in getting Jenny on TV, but also disappointed that we didn't get her on TV enough because shortly after that she passed away. So, but at least we got some of her wisdom on TV and I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. So that's UFO Witness, the new documentary, UFOs uh, Investigating the Unknown. Completely different trajectory. Um, a year and a half ago, I got a call from a TV producer saying, hi, Mark, I'm, I'm working with Leslie Kane. We're developing this um, UFO documentary for CNN. And uh, Les Leslie said, you're the guy to talk to about, you know, about UFO history and about JLN Heineck in particular. So we set up this interview. It was really, it was crazy. They sent an entire TV crew. They took over my house for a day. The interview lasted six hours. And... But it was a great experience. But then the show got put on the shelf. CNN had this huge management shakeup last year. They threw away all sorts of programming that nobody has ever seen. And we were just worried that that was going to happen with this documentary. Well, about less than a month ago, I got an email out of the blue from one of the producers saying, Mark, it's on. We found a home at National Geographic TV and Hulu. Uh, and here are the air dates for when the, when the episodes are going to premiere it on Nat Geo. So that was, you know, that's just the last couple of weeks. And that was just a huge, huge thrill to finally have that show get out to where people can see it. It's I'm still kind of I'm still pretty thrilled about that because I am very happy with the show. Um, you know, there are different segments of the show offering different points of view. And of course, I don't always agree with this person. They don't always agree with me. That comes with the territory. But for the for the most part, though, I thought I thought the show was really effective. You know, Leslie described it as sort of a UFOs 101 for people who are interested and curious but don't know a whole lot about it. And I, I think on that level, I think the show is really a, 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 a smashing success. I think I think everyone on it, you know, should be really proud of their contribution to the show. I, I know I am. I'm, I'm really, really thrilled with how that show ended up. Yeah. And, it, you know, and it's, you know, I'm and of course, I'm just getting really nice reviews, which, of course, I eat that up. You know, I've had, had a couple of people email me and say, you know, I wasn't I didn't know much about you before I watched the show. But now, I, you know, I, I just ordered your book. And, you know, to an author that, you know, that's music to your ears. You're buying my book. That's great. <laughs> well, congrats on that. It's uh, it Thank looks you. good on you. You're a very humble, down to earth guy. <laughs> I wanted to have you on the show just because you've done a lot. You're not out there, you know, puffing up your chest. You're You're doing projects that are highlighting other people and their work. But there's always people behind the scenes and we don't see them on the screen always. And I know you do appear in some of the episodes on your own shows, but mm -hmm. very little. You kind of like to sit back and uh, I've always been, thought you were very well spoken. And I thought Thank today you. was, uh, you know, it's important. The media we get, a lot of it we can't trust or many people don't mm -hmm. trust it. You know, you can't listen to the news. Oh, don't listen to CNN. Well, then where do you go for valuable information? And Jason mm -hmm. and I are proud that our show offers that. We, we vet everybody. Yeah. We don't bring people on. And if they are, you know, opinionated, that's okay. They don't have to agree with us. We don't have to agree yeah. with them. Yeah. And there's many thousands of people that listen to us and I'm sure half of them agree and half of the others don't agree. So it's good for the subject and uh, good for you for pro like producing good content, but not woo, not, you know, 
Mm-hmm. I haven't really heard any negative things about either of your shows. I know UFO Witness, right. you cover a lot of different species. And mm-hmm. some people, you know, have said that um, sometimes it sounds like it's meant to be like scary. But the whole UFO phenomenon, depending on your mindset, is either amazing and exciting or terrifying, right? Yeah. So, or both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's how amazing. I feel. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you just quickly, though, about U- UFO Witness. When when the show got picked up um, and we knew that we were going to go into production, almost the exact same moment I was diagnosed with cancer. So the initial idea with UFO Witness was that Ben and I were going to be um, investigating together. And then all of a sudden I had cancer and it was like, eh, we can't really do that. So I, but, but the producers at Anomaly Entertainment, I give them huge, huge credit. They just bent over backwards to make sure that I could be involved in the show, you know, as much as I possibly could working around my, my, you know, my chemotherapy treatments, all that stuff. They were just really fantastic about accommodating things. So I will always be grateful to Anomaly Entertainment for making it work out the way they did. It was really, really a good thing. I'm very proud of the show. Nice. I'm glad to hear you're doing better health wise. That's most important, right? None yeah. of this yeah. matters if you don't have your health. So, yeah. And Mark, one, one last question uh, on my mm-hmm. part. Uh, what would you say to the budding, you know, uh, couch investigator uh, that, you know, we all used to be at some point, uh, but get out there and, and active in the field and actually contribute to this? Because it, it really is with the subject teamwork to make the dream work. Right, because it's not. Uh, there's a messiah complex, unfortunately, within ufology, where people are saying that they're they are the end all, be all answer to the phenomenon, and uh, they're in it for money. And uh, unfortunately, those are people that you know they stopped playing with the team and went out on their own. So, uh, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get involved in this, has no experience in it, but really wants to be active? How how would they start? I think as much, you know, I've, I've, I have voiced a couple of complaints about MUFON, but just the same, MUFON is, you know, the, I, I don't want to say they're the only game in town, but they're, they're certainly they're the close. biggest. Yeah. Yeah. They're close. They're close to being the only show in town and, and they do do a lot of good things. There's also the, uh, oh gosh, I should have written it down because I can never remember the name, but there's also a really, really interesting incredible uap study group um oh gosh i'm kicking myself now i should i should have looked this up and written it down before we talked do you know the group i'm talking about are you talking about the Um, scientific coalition for uap studies yes that is it yeah that's it i I pulled the louis louis usually louis is the guy that knows all these names (laughs) yeah yeah i went to their first i went to their first gathering in huntsville oh gosh it's i think three two maybe three years ago now uh, and I haven't been able to go since again, in part because just because of my medical stuff. But um, but I went to their first uh, their first event in Huntsville, and I loved it. I had a great time there. There was such a fascinating mix of people, uh, some really great presentations, really great conversations. Um, that was really good. So getting in touch with them, and also you know this is I'm answering this in terms of just learning more about the phenomenon, but also who to report to if you have encountered something unusual in the sky that you don't understand yeah you know these are the people you should go to also the center for ufo studies which i mentioned before uh alan hynek's ufo foundation they're still in chicago they're in a much reduced form they're basically you know stacks of files in in uh people's basements uh david marler has been doing a fantastic job with digitizing and preserving this mountain of historical uh, papers that belong to KUFOS because it's so much of it is Alan's professional papers. Um, so those would be the big three, the UFO studies, which of course I've already forgotten their name again. <laughs> Scientific and, Coalition for UAP Studies. Right, right, right. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to remember that. SCU, so there's that. I think is what they abbreviate as. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's them, there's MUFON and there's KUFOS. Those would be those would be the best places and they all have informative websites you know mm-hmm. uh easiest place to you know read up read about the organization see if they think they might be a fit and again you know I'm, i just want to go back to what i said earlier about those two questions that people would always ask me what did i see has anyone else seen it it turns out a lot of times 
after you've like me, after I had been doing investigating for move on after a while, you know, at first I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But over time, after I had investigated a number of cases, I would be able to say, you know what? Yes. I just had a case like this a couple of weeks ago. It was under very similar circumstances. The object they described was very similar to what you're describing to me now. And that, that moment of being able to validate, you know, instead of just nodding along and saying, well, I'll look into that, you know, to be able to say, you know what, I, I can, I have two pieces of the puzzle that I can put together for you. That's really a cool moment. Yeah. And That's you really feel like, cool moment. and you feel like you're contributing to the data that is needed to be collected on that. Right. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not big picture data. It's, you know, it's, it's very small scale, but it's the human scale, you know? Yeah. And maybe that's what they're looking for. They just want to be validated that I'm not crazy. Others have seen I the same so. and, you know, yeah, I think we're, so. we're counselors sometimes too. We have people share their experiences <laughs> yeah. with us and uh, it's like, wow, I, it's a huge compliment. You trust me uh, enough that, you know, I'm not going to judge you that you get uh, into really intimate details and maybe they're nuts, maybe not, but either way, if we can be a voice and a shoulder for these people, that's uh that, that's a big compliment, you know, and yeah. it to be handled with the utmost care as well, mm -hmm. not to Absolutely. be taken lightly. So yeah, yeah. Perfect. And Mark, where where can people find your work and where, where can people contact you? Well, they can find my book, The Close Encounters Man, at any any chain bookstore, Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon, of course. You can order it on Amazon or Goodreads. Uh, also your, in, your local independent bookseller. I always encourage people to shop at uh, indie booksellers. So you can find the Close Encounters Man pretty much anywhere you, you find, you find books or check it out from your library. Um, and then there is the new show, UFOs Investigating the Unknown. If you have Hulu, you can watch it streaming on Hulu 24-7. Uh, I believe the episodes are still posted on Nat, Nat Geo TV as well. Uh, and eventually the show will migrate to Vice. And then after Vice, it's going to migrate to Disney Plus. So it's nice. going to be a lot of coverage. Nice. Um, so yeah, so just, you know, do a search for the title of the show and it'll tell you where, it, where it's playing on that day. Um, and also I am on uh, uh, Twitter at Mark O'Connell underscore one. And that's O'Connell with two N's and two L's. It's not O'Connor. It's not O'Donnell. It's <laughs> O'Connell. Uh, that, happens, that happens all the time. I always have to throw that in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's where they can follow me. I, I follow UFO Twitter. Um, don't always comment it in a, on it a whole lot, just because it can get kind of nasty. Yep. Now and then, and I I tr I try to avoid that kind of energy when I can. So yeah. So that's where they can find me. Nice. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Louis and I are are honored to have you on. And uh, yeah, I would encourage everybody to uh, check out the book, buy the book, uh, support the author and his research in this. Uh, this is an important topic and uh, talking with people like you that have been, you know, boots on the ground and investigating this. This is important. And uh, thank you so much for, for talking to us today and educating us a little bit more on the subject. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure, guys. It's nice to meet you both. You too.